Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Janati Stolirov II. I'm the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. And today I am pleased to be speaking with Sylvester Geltmeyer from the Netherlands. Welcome, Sylvester. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for your uh, for this opportunity to speak about this. Um, and before we go uh, delve into more techno optimistic ideas that may benefit in the future, especially regarding uh, any sort of virus outbreak, I quickly want to say one thing what I think is of importance and that should be considered. I notice that we as humans sometimes get stuck in this loop, this catch 22, if you will. But it's not a normal catch-22. It goes all directions, but it's still going down in a downward spiral. And uh, this can be of all sorts of sentiments, can be uh, ethnocentrism, political centrism, religiocentrism, sex centrism, or other sorts of sentiments. Uh, we go in this mindset of squabbling, uh, bickering, slandering, and creating an, an unnecessary animosity. Uh, we get stuck with this constant amygdala agitations and hijacks. It becomes an algorithm, a habit. Albert Einstein once said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think it's best in the wake of this situation to transcend from our loops and see things from a helicopter view and develop a broader perspective. It's best, best we put uh, aside our differences because there's more that unites us than what divides us. So that's my introduction. It's more uh, yeah, a philosophical idea that we might take into consideration. So maybe you want to say something about that? Yes, indeed. So I have said previously that we should really think of ourselves as being at war with this virus and with disease and death more generally. And this is a war that all of humanity is fighting that all of humanity should be united in fighting. And so these petty differences, differences of nationality, uh, differences of gender, culture, religion, should matter a lot less than they perhaps used to for some people when we're fighting this war, uh, because this is a common enemy that affects all of us. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I also think that some of these, I understand we as humans, we get these amygdala agitations and hijacks and everything, but I also understand that it becomes more counterproductive than productive, especially in the long term, in the long run. And it becomes more as a distraction. And that's why I want to say this, because I noticed that not only in real life, but also on, on the internet, just put out the audio and analyze the facial expressions and you can always see everybody is fixed in these amygdala agitations and it's not going anywhere. It's just going in a downward spiral. Sometimes you just have to snap out of it and see things from a broader perspective, a helicopter view and say, okay, we might have differences, but now it's the time to, yeah, to cooperate with each other and to find out what's the best way to beat this virus. Yes, indeed. So you have some ideas about how to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, and I would be interested for you to share them with our viewers. Yeah, before I want to say these ideas, I first want to introdu introduce uh, the idea of looking at great ideas. So let's start with the ideas that can be helpful in the future regarding a virus outbreak of all sorts. And first we need to know what is an idea of a great idea. So if someone has a great idea, we should look at its potential. We should look at its potential that it has, might have some potential. And the ID may not be perfect, but it's best if one does not point out the holes of an ID and dismiss it as a whole. It's better to point out the holes and come up with something that fixes those holes. And it's also better to build upon that ID so that the ID can be improved if necessary. So that's the first thing that I want to say and must be established is that if somebody has a great ID, think just as a great ID that might meet, need some improvements here and there. Not, does not necessarily is like completely perfect, but it's a great ID. And that's where everything should start with, with a great ID. 
So just to, uh, do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, yes. So essentially every idea should be exposed to some sort of uh, consideration of its merits, even if it's preliminary, even if it doesn't have all of the components that might be needed to implement it successfully, but there may be some good concepts in there. There may be some promising beginnings there, which if the idea is developed further, could turn into a practical solution to whatever problem we're trying to address. Yes. So my first idea is um, not necessarily about the virus, but the idea of a dynamic system. Uh, often we humans try to create a system, whatever system of government or system you have or rules or laws, and they're more static. But if you build something that's static, it can work for maybe uh, 10 years or 100 years or 200 years. But we never know what might happen in the future. And if you don't adapt, um, if you stay stubborn, um, we might lose the game. So the idea is to have a system that might work for the moment of time, but also to consider that we might adapt things sometimes slightly or sometimes more advanced. Uh, the reason why I believe we should we should always adapt also our systems is because, well, in the wake of a virus, a virus can also adapt and so must we. So um, take, take that in mind that uh, the adaptability of our systems is a smart thinking. It's something very futuristic. It's, it's very much like um, if we figure out something else, then we can adapt towards it. Mm -hmm. Yes. First ID. Yes, and that is uh, quite an important point. I think prior to this pandemic, a lot of societies and economies uh, in the so-called developed world were actually hyper-optimized for one particular set of arrangements, like a lot of the uh, logistical supply chains were following a so-called just-in-time system where businesses were trying to figure out, well, how do we get supplies from point A to point B at the lowest cost possible and just when we need them so that we don't have to stockpile extra inventory. But the problem with that is as soon as circumstances change in any significant way, if there's any disruption along that supply chain or anything that knocks out an aspect of production, for instance, if businesses have to close because there's a pandemic, then that throws the entire system into chaos. But if there were more adaptability within the system, if it were possible uh, for the system to continue functioning, even if a lot of the nodes or a lot of the steps in the process were knocked out, uh, it would have helped a lot. If businesses and individuals had been stockpiling a lot of goods as a habit, as a routine, then having temporary supply disruptions might not have been as bad as it has been uh, with this just-in-time system that indeed the global economy had been utilizing for about the past 30 years. Yes, I agree. I mean, um, that's also the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the idea of wisdom and why wisdom can be helpful, not just only information. And sometimes I look at like uh, Dutch proverbs and you can find a lot of wisdom in like proverbs. Um, like one wisdom is, um, I'm, I'm going to say it immediately in English, is um, if the calf drowns, so the, the, the son of daughter of the cow and the bull, uh, then people will uh, shut the well, that they will put a lid on the well. With that being said is that we often don't make a backup plan first and we often, when it happens, then we decide to uh, do action or think of ideas. Well, it should be the other way around. We should always think ahead of the time. So there's, there's a very wise proverb that teaches us that uh, we should get out of this idea that we only should start taking action when it starts to happen. We sometimes must think in the future and long terms. Um, 
so yeah that that's also um a great wisdom of dutch uh, proverb uh another one is um <laughs> this ironic but um the people you hang around with are the people who infect you or contaminate you so if you're going to meet people who are very much in despair or are cynic about life or uh, uh, think all oh, great ideas should be dismissed, it might take over your mentality. So it's best always to find people or to meet people who are positive, optimistic, and want to bring the best about in each other. So that's that's a great proverb. Um, and there's another one that uh, says like um, splits and uh, knots where the one is connected, the other one is broken. So um, it's also good to meet people who think different than you, uh, who have different opinions, just to figure out maybe we can find something in the middle, like someone has ID A, the other has ID B, ID A and B, you, you have a dialectical uh, discourse and you figure out maybe we should develop an ID C, which is far more better than A and B, and that's also um, the central message about why the dialectic uh, discourse is far more important than just having heated debates and discussions because you're looking at figuring out the best outcome instead of just keep maintaining some sort of uh, premise, some some start. Into, instead of that, you're going to look what is the best outcome out of this. So that's also important to know that wisdom plays a role in in this crisis, so to speak. Yes, indeed. And you spoke into the importance of being proactive rather than reactive, anticipating a crisis or an unusual problem before it happens, having a plan, being prepared. Uh, the United States Transhumanist Party, as the third of its three core ideals, emphasizes using science, technology, and rational discourse to prevent and mitigate existential risks to the human species. So a phenomenon such as a pandemic is a massive risk. And a pandemic like COVID-19 isn't going to wipe out the human species, but it could do significant damage. And yeah, it, would have been nice, it would have been nice if uh, there were some greater anticipation in pretty much every country, every human society of this event, if there were greater capacity within the healthcare system to absorb a major influx of patients so that public officials didn't have to speak about the so-called flattening of the curve and instead would have been ready to uh, treat any number of people who got infected by this disease. The U.S. Transhumanist Party has put forward a set of now 17 proposals that can be found on our website at transhumanist-party.org. We will begin voting on them on Wednesday, March 25th. And the core focus of these proposals is to rapidly build up our capacity to respond to these kinds of events, including through the rapid construction of hospitals, the training of emergency response personnel uh, for this COVID-19 pandemic, but for future pandemics as well. And the stockpiling of medical supplies, the creation of facilities that would hold these supplies in large numbers so that in times of extraordinary need, any hospital, any medical clinic can request them and get what is necessary to treat its patients. So we need to set aside resources. We need to develop extra infrastructure, extra capacity to be able to deal with extraordinary situations like this pandemic. I agree. I agree. Um, it's better to plan ahead than uh, wait till it comes and then to decide what to do. Um, this can be a lesson. And um, from this lesson, we will learn to be more prepared for the future. I agree. Um, so I'm no, now getting more into the other real IDs, uh, the idea of mental support hotlines during a virus outbreak. 
So I noticed um, in my uh, environment, whether it's on Facebook, uh, some people can't handle this situation mentally. Um, they either lose morale or uh, they go on the internet and they get all these incentives and uh, they're going to watch more post-apocalyptic uh, things and everything and they just lose it. They either lose morale or they have a mental breakdown or what have you. So it's best that in these times we also need to have some sort of support hotline, a mental support hotline can be by the means of video chat, can be just calling someone um, where people in the professional world uh, like, uh, um, yeah, uh, psychiatrist or something like that can help people to keep up the morale and to fix uh, the bad thinking in people. Um, it could, could be done uh, mixed economies. Maybe a part can be done by the government financially and a part can be done um, in the private sector. It could be done both. It could be even a cooperation between them. But this is one of the first thing I also think is very important because even if we fix this problem, there's going to be a lot of people who stuck with a lot of anxiety and uh, and they they haven't helped themselves with this anxiety. They're still living on with this anxiety. So that's also important to take mental health into consideration. Yes, indeed. And with all of these social distancing measures it's more difficult now for people to get support uh, from those close to them from people in their community because everybody is physically distant from everybody else and it's necessary in my view for people to proactively reach out to others to friends to uh, members of communities with shared interests and maintain lines of communication virtually. Uh, conversations like the one we're having are extremely important, but everybody should be engaging in these conversations uh, within their social networks, provided, of course, that the conversations are constructive and supportive and give people options for solving uh, some of the problems that they face, improving their situation. And uh, there are hotlines that have been established for other purposes. For instance, suicide prevention hotlines exist uh, throughout the world. And this pandemic is definitely having adverse impacts on the emotional well-being of a lot of individuals. So having some opportunity for people to uh, discuss these thoughts and these feelings uh, would definitely be worthwhile. Uh, but I would say in addition to uh, a hotline of this sort, people should also rely on their friends and acquaintances to help support them in this time and just continuing to have conversations, continuing to check in, uh, having a habit of engaging in virtual discussions every day, uh, I think will help counter a lot of the adverse effects of physical distancing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I have another ID, um, the ID of a ready-made has made suit. Um, mm. The thing about this is that um, it might in the future might be a virus who spreads quicker and might also dwell in the air and just by the contact of your skin already you can infect can be infected so i've thought about if if one can make a pre pre-made hazmat suit that you can keep in like storage buildings in whatever province or state you live different areas it's just a matter of calculation how much citizens is within every state uh, specialized hazmat suits so you can see the full face so there's a transparent shield over it but you can still recognize who you're dealing with so it's not something that hides your nose and your mouth um, and you can also advance that that it becomes more comfortable uh, it can be used in warm weather cold weather it might even be adaptable in sizes um, 
and uh, it is allowed by the law. So you you just show your identification, and somebody sees you, and you see the person, and uh, yeah, the police officer can say it's okay, um, and um, even like maybe baby buggies or uh, baby wagons that has a specialized thing over it, so that people can go outside as well, get their groceries. Uh, it can be used both to prevent to get a disease uh, as well if you have a weak immune system or something like as well if you have a disease and you need to get out um, and then we can maybe establish a system that you can put your suit in something that disinfects it and you can put it on and put it out and that these things are ready made um, police officers might have an insignia with a police logo uh, medical uh, people medical logo uh, people uh, Fire workers, uh, firefighters have another logo, so you can also recognize uh, different functions, and uh, that that would be great if it's already been already been made, and that uh, say if a more dangerous virus outbreak will come, that people can receive these suits, uh, either they be will be sent it or you have to collect it uh, in a nearby uh, storage building or something like that. So that's also an ID. Yes, and these hazmat suits could be included in these warehousing facilities that store emergency medical supplies. Uh, this could be one type of supply that exists within those facilities. Yeah, yes, so yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, yeah, uh, the other idea is, um, say you have a hospital. Mm -hmm. Mostly when you have a hospital, you have buildings surrounding that hospital, all kinds of big buildings. But the idea is of using nearby buildings as an extra hospital in time of crisis. So instead of just building buildings that is only built for a certain function for a company, you can build it with the routing and the hallways and how the toilets should be and the elevators and everything as if it should be a hospital, but it's now running by a company. And when when there is uh, a government saying, well, we need that building, then these people can be sent home, they can work at home. And within seconds, maybe with a modular modular system, or you, you can get stuff out of the walls, uh, you can change it within a few hours into a extra hospital or maybe a uh, uh, quarantine type of hospital. So we have more buildings. Uh, that are being used in a non-pandemic situation just by companies and in a pandemic situation you can turn them into a hospital. So that's the other idea that uh, came into my mind. Yes, multi-purpose buildings. Exactly. That, that is promising because I think even now in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic there will have to be some conversions of buildings for other uses. For instance, with hotels, uh, many people are not traveling right now. They're not mm -hmm. using hotel space, but that space is available potentially to hold patients. Of course, there would need to be some adjustments, but uh, hotels are not necessarily optimally designed to be hospitals right now. They have these narrow hallways, uh, you often have uh, bottlenecks, like a few elevators uh, to get to a particular floor. Uh, if there were wider spaces, more modularity in the rooms, uh, it would have been easier to make that kind of conversion. So focusing on those kinds of building designs is definitely a good idea. Yeah, so that you can use those buildings in times of need uh, uh, f for uh, as as a hops as a hospital. That's the the idea actually. Um, yeah, and then I have just the idea of like super hospitals. Um, it already starts with uh, the entrance, because most hospitals have just a couple of entrances, but this could be a super quarantine hospital that has multiple entrances, more than one and maybe funneled in different um, lines with the use of inflatable pillow walls so that people, a larger group, get uh, into smaller groups. And when they go into the entrance, 
Um, and this ID came to me because I took the elevator and our elevator works is it opens, you go in, it closes. And on the other side, when you're at the right level, it opens and closes again. So maybe you have like these systems in these different entrances where one can go in, um, it closes. The person could be checked if if it is infected. And I think in the future we will have, we will have systems that can be much quicker to check check if somebody's infected and then um, it opens and there's a parallel hospital within the other hospital. So there are actually two hospitals in one building. If it is infected, it goes into the quarantine sections. If it isn't infected, it goes into the non-quarantine section. And then it just, um, that, that, that small compartment just get disinfected like, and then the next person can enter. So, this way you keep a minimal risk of contaminating people who are there who doesn't necessarily have the virus. It can either be done with a with a um, lift system. You can up, maybe go to the quarantine or down or two doors. One door opens or the other door opens. So that's the other idea I have, the super uh, hospital. And it starts with the entrance because then you can um, contaminate the virus more. Yes, that's an excellent idea, and I think it should be incorporated within the designs of new hospitals, including the hospitals that the U.S. Transhumanist Party is advocating to be rapidly constructed in response to this pandemic. I think it's worthwhile to remember that hospitals are multi-purpose facilities. They uh, treat patients with a wide range of conditions, and they also provide a lot of diagnostic services like uh, imaging uh, scans of various sorts. So if a patient comes in for one type of service, we definitely don't want that patient to contract an infection from another patient who's coming in to get treated for that infection. But that's a very common problem in hospitals today, actually. In the United States, hospital-acquired infections kill about 90,000 people per year, as compared to for instance, automobile accidents, which kill between 35 and 40,000 people per year. And automobile accidents are uh, quite uh, a prominent cause of death in the United States, but hospital-acquired infections are even more so. Uh, so if there is a design aspect, an aspect of the architecture of the hospital that could separate the infected patients from everyone else, uh, that could save a lot of lives. Exactly. That, that's that's why I thought of this super hospital to already at the start uh, separating the people who are contaminated and who aren't so that you keep a minimal uh, risk. Um, another idea is that uh, the idea of um, both self-checking if you have the virus uh, or um, the idea of uh, getting an, um, how you say it, um, when you want to get rid of the disease with an, uh, I forget the word, an, um, when you have a weaker sickness and you put it in your body and yes, vaccination, vaccination, inoculation. Yeah. yeah. So that in the future, maybe um, we develop systems instead of going to a doctor to check or get a vaccination that it can be sent to you at home. It's some sort of sick system that you maybe put on your wrist and you get a red or blue, oh, you're infected or you aren't, and, or something, a vaccination that is less hurtful and you can self-vaccinate yourself. So maybe that can also be established like um, a system, because if you do that quicker, you you we can inform each other quicker like i am affected or you are not infected as well as i have a vaccination etc etc it's much quicker than to go somewhere and also uh, risking other people's etc so that's the other idea i have yes indeed so efforts are already underway to develop these kinds of kits for the covid 19 virus there's a scientist named jonathan rothberg who actually has a large yacht that he's using as a research lab. And his goal is to develop an inexpensive 
COVID-19 test kit that people can get mailed to their homes and they can do the tests in their homes without exposing other people to the risk of infection. So yes, the more opportunities exist for people to perform these tests on themselves within their own space without having to go to a medical facility, the easier it is on the capacity of the healthcare system and the safer it is for every, uh, everyone else from the standpoint of uh, infectious disease risk. Exactly. Um, yeah, and the other thing, uh, other idea have, has more to do with the upcoming uh, development in robotics, because we see a surge in the development of robotics. I saw some robots of Boston Dynamic, which were very impressive. Uh, they can walk, they can run, they can even do a backflip. Um, and I think uh, these robots will play a role in our society, especially in, uh, in when a pandemic is going to happen or something like that, because a robot cannot have an infection. So that's the first thing. A robot can always help you. It cannot have an infection. So say um, somebody might uh, uh, have breathing problems and need to get somewhere. Uh, robots can be sent and, this, and it can, this person can be brought to a hospital or somebody, uh, an older person needs to get groceries but um, has problem with walking. A robot can be helpful to help that older person uh, getting the groceries, etc. So robots will also play a large role in the future if we use them wisely. Yes, indeed. And robots, uh, as you mentioned, because they don't transmit infections, can be utilized to help people who are staying at home nonetheless get essential functions. If you have an autonomous vehicle, uh, that can be used to deliver food and then you have some sort of delivery robot in that autonomous vehicle who gets up and walks to your door and gets you the food, you have no risk of contracting an infection from that robot or that entire arrangement. Likewise, if you have more manufacturing automated, if you have more food production automated so that you don't need people to go into crowded factories anymore, that also reduces the risk of the spread of infection and more people can choose to remain at home if uh, they want to protect themselves. Exactly. Uh, another idea um, that I have is that every sovereign state in the world should have like a 50% 50, 50 balance between a producing economy and a thinking economy. Like the Netherlands uh, outsources too much to other countries. Um, I work at the airport and I uh, stock Electronica store. And the thing that strikes me the most is not only during this crisis, uh, less people are going to buy the products, but also the, when, uh, when we receive our stocks, uh, gradually during this crisis, uh, it became less and less and less because simply most of the electronics comes from uh, China. So uh, that's also an idea to create uh, uh, our, all our sovereign states a, a more balanced uh, thinking and producing economy. So there are an, enough things that other countries that we outsource, we can also do ourselves, including making our own electronics, including making our own sport shoes and clothing and other stuff. This is also needed because during a crisis, some of these medical devices also comes out of other countries and you need to have these medical uh, devices very quick. So it's just smart thinking to have a 50-50% of uh, thinking economy as well as producing economy. So this speaks to robustness of our productive capacity in any given country because, uh, of course, there's a lot of value to international trade, to comparative advantage. If you can produce something less expensively in another country and then import it, that can free up resources to uh, produce something else in your own country. But on the other hand, there has to be some sort of provision for 
disruptions in those supply chains. Like right now, there's no international travel anymore, essentially. And some goods may still be coming in, but uh, even the flow of goods has been greatly disrupted because of this pandemic. So what does one do in that situation? There has to be some sort of backup capacity if a country is cut off from the rest of the world involuntarily for whatever reason, it still has to be able to produce the necessities of life as well as uh, the widest range uh, of possible tools, devices, components for devices uh, so that everyday life and essential functions can keep operating. Exactly. That's that's very great because uh, although it's good to uh have trade with other countries. It's also good to consider that some of these crises can disrupt it. And if your economy is, let's say, 80% the thinking economy and 20% only producing economy, you're going to have a problem. Uh, and that's why I believe there should be more balanced, uh, a little bit more bluer than we should be. Um, another idea is uh, we need to have like a central place, a central it could be the internet, uh, let's say a black box where people can send in their IDs, uh, tell their IDs uh, or maybe write down their IDs and that we can uh, collect these IDs um, and build upon these IDs, improve these IDs. Maybe an A and a B ID doesn't work, but together it creates a C ID so that we have this collective thing of IDs that we can gather and we can gather information and with this information we can turn it into wisdom. Um, I think it's best to listen to each other's ideas and to improve it because that way we are going to figure out how to get this crisis uh, done. So to fix this crisis just by listening to ideas first because now there's too much chaos. Nobody has a great ID. Everybody is telling each other it's that fault, it's that fault, it's that fault, but we have to start with IDs and collecting those IDs. Without those IDs, nothing will happen. It always starts with an ID. So that's one of the IDs, to have some platform where people can center IDs and that maybe people maintain that platform and try to filter it and analyze it and think, hmm, that could be very smart and hmm, that could be smart and so that we have these IDs and that they don't get lost because there are a lot of people uh, in their homes now who might have great IDs, but they don't know where to put their IDs or who to tell them to because they only have great IDs and they don't have a million dollar, million dollar company to execute all these IDs. So we need to have one platform where we can collect, collect all these IDs. Yes, and the U.S. Transhumanist Party has endeavored to serve as that platform by means of its exposure periods when we have policy deliberations. We always uh, open the opportunity up for people to contribute their ideas uh, over a certain period of time here uh, because we are dealing with a time-sensitive situation. We've allowed seven days for people to post their ideas on our website, on the post for our emergency seven day exposure period for platform vote number eight. But often we would give 15 days or up to 30 days depending on the subject matters discussed and how many uh, areas we're seeking to cover. And in the future, we're going to continue following this process, having more of these exposure periods uh, so that people are able to contribute their suggestions. And then, as you said, uh, there's a process for evaluating them, for putting them on the ballot, for our members to vote on. Uh, members can propose various options for wordings or policy provisions, and then the vote is done uh, using the ranked preference approach. So people can rank order all of the options according to uh, what they favor relative to other possibilities. Yeah, that would be very smart because um, some people are just great at thinking of great ideas. Other people are more talented in executing these ideas. So if we cooperate with each other, we might uh, get good results. Um, 
and the last thing because I kind of set all my IDs. It, it's not that much, but it's it's powerful. Um, is the ID of um, in terms of vaccines and stuff like that to protect the vaccination because um, if somebody is going to patent a certain type of vaccination, that basically means that somebody can stock that into a refrigerator and that others cannot use it. So the idea of protecting things that really can save mankind uh, from more deaths, the idea of making laws and agreements about what can be patent and what cannot be patent and is protected. So that is also very important to realize that some things uh, is dangerous if we put a patent on it, even though uh, people might have egos and want to uh, keep it to themselves. It's just too dangerous and that we should work together. All these people who are doing research about this virus, whether it's uh, laboratories or people who try to figure out how this virus works and that we can keep, keep this community going without um, putting the vaccine if somebody discovered into the refrigerator and nobody can use it or only a, a special kind of group can use it or what have you. So we need some sort of protection that humanity uh, can always use uh, a vaccine if needed. Yes, indeed. And I completely agree with you. Often medical patents can be an impediment to the spread of a particular cure or treatment because it becomes artificially expensive and artificially limited in its supply. So to counter that, the U.S. Transhumanist Party has proposed greatly shortening the time frames of most medical patents, but I also think it should be worthwhile to consider ways to get treatments or preventative measures like vaccines developed without any patents and find other ways to compensate the developers, for instance, bounties, instead of giving an exclusive right to produce and profit from something, give uh, an immediate large payment to the developer. If you develop some advance, you should be compensated for it, but why not give you the money right now in exchange for making that treatment available for anybody to manufacture if they have the ability. So private corporations, governments, uh, small facilities uh, with, uh, for, for instance, biohacking enthusiasts who want to maybe even modify that vaccine uh, to a certain extent. There have been biohacking labs that have been able to cheaply uh, reverse engineer a lot of common drugs, uh, for example, that would have cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. But in many countries, this is illegal because it either infringes on a patent or the regulatory authorities uh, wouldn't approve of that. And I think there needs to be a lot more flexibility. If the knowledge about how to safely and effectively manufacture a given treatment or preventative measure is out there, people should be allowed to use that knowledge to help prevent or mitigate disease. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, if you do that, um, the vaccines can be sp spread much for, uh, faster if you communicate what you know about each other, uh, different companies, maybe also government or a cooperation between companies and government. And the outcome is more important that people are getting these vaccines than just the ego. Of course, if somebody discovers it, uh, all credits, the name and the last name will be shown, uh, probably a Nobel Prize, okay, but that it keeps open source, that everybody can kind of use it. If if you do that, it's far more better than just close it in and put it in the refrigerator and only be used by certain types of people or what have you, because um, it's better for mankind. Um, and these are actually all my ideas I have thus far. Yes, indeed. Well... Thank you, Sylvester. I greatly appreciate you offering these ideas for our consideration. What I will do is include many of these ideas in the exposure period uh, and prepare them for a forthcoming vote by the United States Transhumanist Party. 
Again, voting begins on Wednesday, March 25th, and it will go for three days. So if uh, you're a member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party anywhere in the world, uh, you would be able to vote on these proposals. And I think it's fitting because the entire world is dealing with this pandemic right now. And many of these are solutions that could be applied in any country, uh, because any country can use improved infrastructure, more resilience, uh, greater access to treatment, uh, greater social support for people who are affected by this pandemic. So uh, I'm glad that we are having more and more of these channels of communication across borders, because even though we can't travel across borders right now, with the technology we have available at our disposal, we can still have the free flow of ideas. And that exactly. is the yes. most important aspect. Yes, true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it. I have nothing more else to say. So maybe you can uh, finish it up by saying something important that you think needs to be said in this conversation. Yes, indeed. Well, for me, this entire situation highlights the vast importance of emphasizing public health and longevity as a key priority for our economy and for our society. This has been underemphasized in many economies uh, up to now, but we have seen the consequences of not emphasizing it. Uh, we have healthcare systems strained in many countries that were supposed to have advanced economies and advanced medical systems. But they were indeed just-in-time systems, systems that tried to optimize themselves for uh, certain levels of typical demand, but they did not anticipate extraordinary demand. And furthermore, it's important to recognize the number one risk factor for COVID-19, as well as many other common infections, is biological aging. People who are biologically old are by far more likely to suffer serious complications and death from COVID-19 and other infections. Every single year in the United States alone, 37,000 people on average die from influenza. Yeah. Sometimes older people succumb to the common cold, and yep. it is a tragedy. But if we can bring this uh, problem of biological aging under control, then many fewer people will succumb to infections. And this is one reason why the U.S. Transhumanist Party is proposing at least a $100 billion funding package per year to anti-aging research. This has to begin now in order to alleviate the damage from future pandemics. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for listening to what I have to tell. Um, and I hope uh, it might be of use. And uh, yeah, that's it. I, I don't have anything else more to say than that. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, listening for what I had to say. Well, thank you, Sylvester, for having this conversation with me, for offering these ideas. I think all of our viewers enjoyed what you had to say today. Thank you. I bid you farewell. <laughs> farewell. Yes, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs>